Welcome to Testimony Mountain. Such a joy to have Jesse back. We've had uh, <laughs> different schedules with vacation and travel and so I've missed being together, but really happy to be back. And Jesse, do you want to share some upcoming things? I know you've got something in uh, Maine. Uh, August uh, 10th through 12th, we have the beautifully adorned workshop that's up in Maine. And you can uh, go to my website, kingdomlivingwithjesse.com to get tickets for that. And that's going to be, um, we had the first beautifully adorned course at Adina's yeah. um, place, and that turned out excellent. Uh, so the workshop is just a little different. It's not the full course. Uh, we'll take segments of the course, but it's really meant to give people time where we're doing more like a workshop. And in a group setting, you'll be able to work through some of the different um tools and techniques that we teach uh that help people work through their healing process journey so um it's got all the same goody good nuggets that are in the course but uh the bonus is that you get to be in a group setting and get to work with a group um, as you're working on your healing process so very dynamic and i'm really excited for it so it's fantastic. And we're looking forward to having you come back here to the Austin right. area in October. Yeah, we got to talk about that. <laughs> yes. So. so lots of good stuff coming up. And I really encourage people is, you know, it's one thing to, you know, watch the course and have mental ascent here, but really going deep in community and walking those tools out is so, so, so very important. So encourage people to be able to go to that main if you're anywhere near and if the Lord is leading yeah. you. And if you're not able to come to Maine, uh, the course is now available on the website, uh, Kingdom Living with Jesse, and just look for the Beautifully Adorned course. Um, it's got several sections. Um, you know, we did two full days with that, and um, it it really is powerful. Uh, the one thing with the course and the work that you're not going to get in the workshop is in the course, we really break down um, how programming works, um, even for people who may not know that they're in a specific program, it's become a base for uh, some of our educational systems and things. Uh, so we break that down and um, it, you know, it's meant to really help you understand um, how the system works, how they fit the average people into the system yeah. and how you break free from that. So. And it's so good to know this. And I, I, I believe that getting the information out um, to um, to the church to understand this. And, you know, I think it was Kathy Fox put something out recently about um, the percentage of uh, people who are mind controlled, you know, in the United States, potentially the world, just based on estimates. But then, you know, it was interesting because she gave a percentage and it was a very, very small percentage, she said, of people who actually know that they are in the system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, that was the case for me is I didn't know until a couple of you know years ago that that was the case. And so, you know, I have people go, oh, well, that's not me. I don't, you know, I wasn't in the system. I wasn't, you know and not understanding dissociation and how it is possible to be completely oblivious to how you were used or are being used. And, you know, I say that not from a place of fear, but from a place of overcoming, you know, mm -hmm. is yeah. uh, because we were in the system, we have an incredible opportunity for restoration um, right. with the Lord. So anyway, Sorry. We're going to dive in today. We were just chatting beforehand. Uh, I was in Florida for some different things, visited with a friend, and uh, she invited my husband and I to go see Sound of Freedom. And I know this is a controversial thing um, mm -hmm. in the body of Christ and even nationally for everything. And um, I was not planning to go because of some of the roots of just what I've studied, the people that are connected to it and so on. Um, and then she bought tickets before I knew what was happening. <laughs> and um, like, so, darn, I gotta go. <laughs> and so I felt the Lord saying it was okay to go and uh, to just go with intention to go to release blessing um, and the love of God and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, 
and to be able to see, you know, because I've talked to different groups about why, you know, I don't think it's this great, great movie that everybody should necessarily see. And I thought, well, I should see it to see if what I'm talking about, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to open up kind of some discussion on that. So do you have some thoughts, Jesse, on that? I do. So what I think I would like to start with is what I like about it is, you know, I, I like the what would we call it? The awareness for the topic itself of trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, I think that every you know individual needs to be aware of how vast and how big um, the organized trafficking of children and women is. And so, you know, I love that it creates that awareness. It shows some of the methods. Um, you know, it's not the only way. Um, you know, it primarily focuses on. Um, I would call it like groups that do modeling or talent searches, how they, you know, pull kids in through those, um, you know, and making those connections with the parents, getting them to drop the kids off, thinking that this is going to be, you know, something that will give their child success. And the next thing you know, the child is missing and, um, you know, but as a parent, you've signed contracts, you've signed things giving them permission. So basically they have all legal rights to have your child and now you have no idea where your child is. So, you know, but keep in mind that that's just one of the ways, you know, we've spoken of so many other ways that the system traffics children. So I think that that's great, but there was a lot that I saw that really was concerning, not with the movie or the material in the movie itself. But again, like you said, with those around it or the interconnections to those who have made or who are marketing uh, this film. Yes, Do you, are you able to share some of those connections or? Yeah, I think, you know, like for me, growing up in that system, you know, right away I see uh, people wearing distinguishing marks like necklaces or things that I know uh, mean that they're part of an order, that they're connected to an order that is paid for by the Vatican. Um, you know, so then it's like, why, why, are, why is the Vatican promoting this movie? Um, you know, and I know that several of the individuals are connected to that same order. So that was a big red flag. Um, Another one was at the very end that, you know, it just can't be coincidence, but they had a huge pay it forward thing they were promoting, but the pay it forward cost for tickets was $6. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about that, six, 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 you know, you're like, hmm, okay, so the Vatican is fundraising, pay it forward tickets, but they're all six, 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 you know, um, yeah, so it just, you know, I, I think those things aren't coincidental. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other things is the easy access that they're getting places. Um, you know, I am an eyewitness of satanic ritual and crimes against children and crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, I, I struggle to get my foot anywhere to have my voice heard. Yeah. Yet, as secondary witnesses... Um, you know, these individuals are able to get into, um, get easy access to places uh, to have their voice heard. You know, in some ways I'm, I'm thankful because, hey, great, somebody's paving the way. Now let Jesse speak, right? Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, if it really shuts the door for true eyewitnesses, um, you know, that is something to be concerned about. Yeah. And I, I believe there's also the, the Mormon connection as well that's there. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, watching it um, again with intention with the Lord, you know, that the emphasis was kind of on, you know, here's America saving the day and saving children from other countries. And, you know, at the very end in, you know, just white letters on a black screen, it did say the truth that, um, you know, the United States is the biggest consumer, um, you know, of sex yeah. trafficking and participating in that. But the whole movie 
you know, the, the frequency of it was, you know, good America, you know, rescuing other people instead of going, mm -hmm. hey, this is happening, you know, right In next country. Door. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, they didn't even get into, you know, the trafficking that's happening through the Mormon church or the Catholic church or even CPS. Um you know, in our country alone, there is so much trafficking happening. And, you know, the, just those looking at those three things would just be scratching the surface of, of how it's happening. Yeah. And so it's great that it the topic is being exposed, but also it's not the full picture. It felt like, you know, half truths mm -hmm. um, in some places, even potentially lies, you know, in that... Um, they had this scene where, um, you know, kids were being snatched off the street. And, it, you know, as a parent, it's quite traumatizing as a, you know, grandparent, you know, it's like, oh no, you know, it, it, it stirs up this yeah. fear when the percentage of kids who are taken that way, um, my understanding is very small in comparison yeah. to churches, schools, Boy Scout, other grooming, CPS and breeder programs. So. Right. And then you have, you know, it, it kind of took a look at, you know, we'll say a paramilitary group that, you know, was focused on or former, you know, they became former government employees, you know, who devoted themselves to doing that rescuing and stuff. When, you know, in my experience and many other survivors experience, you know, the military, the law enforcement, that is a huge bulk of those who are highly involved, especially with child pornography. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it was almost like there was a diversion, like they're creating awareness of uh, exposing the issue. But at the same time, they're diverting our eyes away from, you know, who really is involved? How vast is this? And how is this really happening? And it kind of desensitizes, you know, because people think, oh, well, the reality is not that many children really get snatched. So now we can be relieved. This really isn't a problem in our area that we need to be concerned about. When the truth is, is that, you know, how are children being trafficked, even to military law enforcement? You know, it's happening straight out of our public schools yeah. where kids are showing may show up. You know, why did the majority of the schools say that they're, that ch every child has to be there um, to be marked for attendance, you know, in the morning? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they'll say it's because of their school funding. Mm -hmm. Well, I would propose that really it's because, you know, where's that funding really coming from? It's coming from special programs and our schools are part of the biggest you know, suppliers of children um, to the military and other groups that are trafficking children. And, you know, it's like you go, you get marked present, and then you go to your special trainings, um, you know, which may be off campus, may not be, yeah. you know, and it always looks like you're there. You have community people who work within, volunteer within those schools who will vouch the children are there and no matter what the child says, um, you know, you've got adult witnesses that will give you the narrative of what is really happening. Wow. Wow. And kind of going back to that um, ease of access, I've been noticing kind of the same thing where, where um, uh, reading books, like if there's, I, you know, and I honor all survivors and whistleblowers, I really do, for getting out whatever truth they can. Um, but I was reading an excellent one, but they were pointing out all of these other, you know, forms of the system, but they were pro-Catholic, you know? And it was like, oh, that's why it was so easy to get this book, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> right. <laughs> the books of survivors that you can't get that are out of print or that are $500 on Amazon or something like that, um, you know, they're more likely telling the full truth. And so it is interesting, you know, to look at these things to go, okay, well, you may be telling this part of the story, 
but mm -hmm. you're not telling this part of the story or you're promoting something that is another part of the system, you know, mm -hmm. and whether it's, whether they're aware of that or not, it's just something to be able to see, not to be paranoid about everything you read. Um, right. because they may or may not be aware, you know, of what they're doing. Um, but having grace. Right. Yeah. And I think that's important because, you know, within that system, there's always that dichotomy of, of the good and the evil. And in your trauma, you know, or we'll say in general, in the trauma bonding experience, they will always have two, those two groups of people in that child's life. You know, they'll set up who, who are your abusers and who are your safe people. Mm -hmm. And they will direct you towards individuals that really you do know as your safe people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your safe people may be a, your abusers too, yeah. but because you're taught that they're your safe people and maybe they're not as aggressive or graphic or, you know, horrific in their abuse. So you, you automatically associate um, that abuse with love and tenderness and kindness. And you're like, oh no, that person's good to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that person loves me, even though that person is abusing you too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think most Christians don't know, don't understand these types of things. I think we were raised like it's either good or it's bad and not, not understanding how the system uses both of those things to, to intermingle. Yeah. And I, and I think that that might be part of the, you know, the division that you see, you know, in the Christian community and the survivor community about, you know, sound of freedom is they're like, but it's good, but it's good. It's drawing attention, you know? <laughs> and, um, I was, you know, mentioning to you earlier, talking to a friend about how, um, the, the fervor of the division seems so much more than just, hey, you don't want to see the movie. You don't want to see the movie. That's okay. <laughs> you know, like, okay, right. I'm going to see Batman or I'm not going to see Batman. You know, who cares? But this really intensity to it. And it got me to, to thinking about, you know, the power of, you know, it's not more powerful than God, of course, but how the system will put out those curses and witchcraft types of stuff. And I feel that that is possibly what's going on with the sound of freedom with intention to divide, you know, the Christian community. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I see the same thing too, where, you know, either way there seems to be a, a curse with it. Like, you know, if you're, it seems like if you're not going, what I've been hearing is a lot of attacks like, oh, well, then you're not really like for mm -hmm. stopping child trafficking or, you know, like, why would you not invest your money in stopping child trafficking? Mm -hmm. Yet those who say don't go, you know, they're like, well, you know, things are shoddy and you're supporting those who are trafficking. Yeah. So yeah. either way, it seems like there's a, a curse with it. And it really brought me back to, there's a passage in the book of Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians, where we see this same type of division happening in the early church. And Paul addresses that issue. And what was happening was that you had, um, you know, they would get together for dinners and um, feasts. And, and what would happen is that people would bring food uh, that they all would share and partake in. But you had some people that, you know, were kind enough to bring the meat. But the problem was, was that the only places you could buy meat were at the meat markets and it would always be offered to idols first before it was sold. So some of the believers were pitching a fit saying, you know, that meat, we can't eat it. It was offered to idols. And you know, then you had those who really had no problem with it. They were like, everything belongs to God. God knows that it was offered to idols, but yet it's, you know, it's redeemed. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it, as long as we pray over it, God's going to bless whatever we put into our body because he knows me is important to us. So you had this argument and what does Paul say? You know, he calls those that, you know, were 
were afraid to eat the meat because they thought they would be judged by God for it. He tells, you know, those who have no issue with it to be sensitive Mm -hmm. to the weaker brother, not to judge them, not to say bad things, you know, not to condemn them for their belief. You know, that's fine. If they don't want to eat the meat, don't make them eat the meat. Don't gloat while you're eating the meat. (laughs) You know, just quietly sit there and eat your meat without, you know, making it an issue. And so, you know, I think that that speaks truth even for today. You know, we, because that's where the division is, is that, you know, we're not just allowing people to make their choice. We're putting a judgment with it. You know, we're using it with a judgment to divide and, uh, you know, it has, I've, I've heard from some people that they've lost relationships over this movie and, you know, it's like, this is not even the tough stuff people like wait till the (laughs) truth, you know, (laughs) wait till the survivors start getting to really speak out. Like if you want the tough stuff, we're not even there yet. So you know, these are certainly not issues that should be dividing us yet. But I think the reality is, is that we need to prepare our hearts that there are going to be things coming in the near future that will divide. And we're told that the divide is so, so extreme, you know, where father will turn against son and son against father. And You know, I'm seeing this kind of this uprising, this violence that is accompanied with this division where people really get violent towards each other about it and about defining that dividing line. So those are things we need to be preparing ourselves for uh, because things aren't going to be a nice cakewalk. Um, You know, it's time to put on our big boy pants and yeah. Big girl pants and, you know, understand that we are in a war. You know, this is a spiritual war and that phys- that spiritual war is going to manifest physically as well. Yes. And I think, you know, understanding that, you know, the basis of who God is, is love. Mm-hmm. And that love expressed in relationship and the relationship trumps belief systems, and you can't make someone else believe something um, that they're not ready for. Um, you know, you can influence, you can, you know, gently encourage, but when we try to make that a, a dividing factor or whether we're going to, you know, be friends with someone or be around someone, you know, it, it becomes very uh, not so good, you know? Yeah. Um, You just reminded me there's another great book um, that kind of talks about this issue, but um, I'm forgetting his name. It's something Spear, but it's called Christ at the Round Table. It's from the early 1940s, I think Mm -hmm. 40s, 50s. But he was a missionary in India. And what's neat about that book is he's got some chapters that um, where he, he was a friend to Gandhi. Mm-hmm. And he talked about Gandhi's beliefs that Gandhi did not believe in Jesus Christ. And he was with Gandhi um, in his passing and said that even in his passing, Gandhi, um, you know, rejected Jesus Christ. He believed that his good works would get him into heaven. So kind of just what you were saying there is, you know, that relationship, how, you know, this individual, he still, you know, ministered to Gandhi, was there with him as he passed. And, you know, just like God does, he, he allowed Gandhi to be in his, in his decisions. You know, he wasn't pushing Jesus down his throat or bumping him over the head with a Bible. Um, He allowed Gandhi to, you know, reap the consequences for his choices. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And, and so that type of love that's willing to invest in someone, not um, with the expectation yeah. of you have to be saved or I won't be your friend, but just right. simply loving, you know, and that's what we, we should be about. Um, that's what we should be known for. And, um, 
Yeah, I was just talking to a gal coming, you know, who came out of the LGBT and trans community. And she said that was the first place where she felt accepted and loved. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I really honor her testimony because she's passionate about loving these people while still having that, you know, conviction of, you know, that it is, it is sin, but not coming at it from, let me beat you over the head with it. The head or be strict. You know, it's funny because um, for a time I did a lot of street ministry and dealt with a lot of gothics and, you know, we'll call it just alternative subgroups, um, you know, that kind of revolve around goth, Satanism, uh, Luciferianism and stuff. And the biggest thing that all that was a common denominator between the majority of the individuals that were in, were sucked into those type of subculture ministry groups um, was that they came from very over dominating strict religious homes wow. where it wasn't about relationship with God or with one another. It really was about, you know, that religious spirit and um, that religious spirit drove people straight into witchcraft, Satanism, goth, vampirism. Um, you know, they wanted nothing to do with religion. Yet the majority of those people, when you really take the time to sit down and have a, a discussion about God or theological things, some of the most profound, mm -hmm. in-depth complex spiritual conversations that I have ever had, wow. um, you know, it would just blow my mind where it's like, wow, like, you know, I mean, they would talk about such, they had such a depth of understanding of really of God, even though, you know, they wouldn't claim to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but mm -hmm. they understood spiritual truths and, yeah. A lot of times lived it more than those who <laughs> claim to have to have that, you know, yes. the religious yes. experience. And it's 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 tough walking it out, um, but I believe you know that that is one of the keys in in this season. What we need most is that love, is that unconditional love being demonstrated, um, even when it's difficult or hard. And I think, you know, really, how is that? I, I think, you know, demonstrated is a great word, but I think there's another word and that word is experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I've gone through my chaplain career, what I've realized is people, they don't want to be told. They don't yes. want to hear all the knowledge you have about God mm -hmm. or about love. Like what they want is to experience it. Yeah. And, you know, how does that really look? How does it look to love someone in their last moments? You know, they're not wanting to be told, you know, I love you or someone loves you. Like they want to know that they're safe, that, that, uh, you know, they're secure, that somebody is there, that somebody does love them. And it can only come through that experience and showing that. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes we throw things like affection and touch and, all of that out, the, you know, eye contact is another one. I, I admit I struggle with that one because, you know, that goes back to some of my abuse as a child. Um, but how important that is really to people. To yeah, have. definitely. And it's interesting to me because we can, we can learn the behaviors of connecting and, you know, what kind of looks like love and yet not be connected, um, you know, on an emotional level, on a deep level, um, you know, which is what everyone's longing for. You can look like a loving person, but people close to you, you're still emotionally distant. And, you know, that's something I'm walking through, you know, again, because of abuse in the background of, you know, avoiding that close intimacy. And so mm -hmm. it's like, you can, smile, you can be, you know, look like you're caring or loving, but it, it often can be just learned behavior and not um, really coming from the heart. 
I, I think you're absolutely right on that, that, you know, in a way we're trained, you know, that's part of the cover life. We're trained to make it look good, fake it till it's believed, yes. um, you know, that you really love someone. And, you know, to this day, like I still struggle to really receive compliments from people or to receive words of affection because I got that all the time as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, before my abuse, they would be telling me, you know, oh, what a good little girl you are, mm -hmm. you know, and then you're like, wait a second, good little girl shouldn't get this, you know, and, um, you know, they would do all sorts of horrible stuff. Usually it would come before, you know, they would use it as a threat, you know, when I had done something that really was good, mm -hmm. like trying to, you know, tell on the abuse that was happening and then they, the virtue squad would throw me into a, you know, closet or, or a hole or basement or something, you know, but in that they would still be telling, you know, they would be using it as a way to mock. Um, but it's like, you know, how precious are those things when, you know, really it is felt from our heart. And, you know, that's something that I, the Lord took a couple of years to deal with me on was behind it is really the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. Yeah. And in scripture, you know, Genesis six, he says that he sent the flood to destroy those past generations because every intention of their heart was always evil. Yeah. And when I really started to pay attention to that, you know, not just my own thoughts towards other people, but, you know, it's like, you realize I don't I don't know what other people are really thinking of me unless I ask. Yeah. You know, and some people I'm glad they don't share their thoughts because they're not good. But others, you know, it's like when people really do give the genuine you know comments and when you receive that, you know, that's when you feel that love. You know, I can remember the first time that, you know, one of the first very genuine ones I got was actually David Zublick. Mm -hmm. um, we had already worked together for quite some time. I want to say it was like a, over a year and a half, maybe close to two years. And there was nothing else behind it, you know, not like he wasn't trying to like come on to me or, you know, like trying to flatter me in any way, like he just honestly meant it. And it was his body language that went with it, like where all of a sudden I just came on the Zoom and he sat back in his chair and he was like, my God, Jesse, you are such a beautiful woman, you know? Wow. And it was just like that first time where it was like, wow, like somebody, somebody actually sees me as a beautiful woman. Like the first time you realize a comment like that, mm -hmm. you know, where somebody sees you as something and how powerful that is if when we can really learn to give that out, you know, how we see other people yes. in a way that builds them up and lifts mm -hmm. them up and encourages them is most of the time for most of us, you know, we spend our average day just getting clobbered and hit and the enemy's attacking us with, you know, how unworthy, how unattractive, how undeserving we are. And that's all we get all day long. And, you know, like that comment just made me, you know, like oftentimes I feel like that like warrior that's like stuck in the trench full of mud, right? And it's like, what am I but a warrior God, right? <laughs> and it was like that one comment, like it just had this image of myself, like peeking my head up and was like, damn it, the enemy may have me down in this mud, but God got it, I'm beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so beautiful. And, and I think, you know, at least from my family of origin, it you weren't given compliments because that would make you proud. So <laughs> right, you'd get the puffy head syndrome. <laughs> you were so afraid of getting prideful, you know, or making someone else proud. So you didn't say those words of encouragement, you know, and it's, it's beautiful today to be able to say to my kids, I'm really proud of you and be okay with it, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
I used it for a time when the Lord was kind of teaching me how to do that. Um, He'd given me assignment at my job where he told me to, to like watch my coworkers. And like, I kind of had a, a rotating schedule, but the Lord had told me, you know, there was a certain number of them that I needed to give a compliment to, um, you know, throughout each week. And it kind of went where they each were getting at least one a month. Mm -hmm. And I would like sit down and write these little notes and slip it in their little box and, and tell them what I really authentically appreciated about them. And, you know, it was just interesting. Like one of them, you know, we totally had different beliefs. He, he was a Satanist and, Mm -hmm. um, and we had had some interesting discussions. Well, um, I did volunteer coordination at that job as well. And he had been helping me do some recruiting for volunteers. So, you know, a couple of times, like we had gone out in the communities and had put flyers places, but in the travel time was when we had these very interesting discussions. And we ended up several times where we were just hysterically laughing so hard at, you know, because it was just that dynamic between Christianity and Satanism. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like I love, I love just laughing with you. It was like, thank you for just adding laughter to my day. Right. And you're like, you put stuff aside. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I had one that um, was a, you know, homosexual in a committed relationship. Um, But he was the best darn volunteer coordinator assistant I ever had. Like, you know, I mean, we worked so well together, just like the back of each other's hands where he'd be like, okay, give me your dream what do you want this to look like? And I'm like, well, here's what I'd like it to look like. Every way he excelled in meeting my dream, going above and beyond. And it was like, man, that guy's just good at his job, you know? So when we can learn to just love and appreciate people, and it it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, stifle or compromise our beliefs or say, you know, I mean, we can let them know where we stand in things. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we have to shove that as a dividing wedge unless the Lord says, you know, you are not supposed to have contact with this person. I have had certain people where the Lord will not even allow me to build that relationship. Like immediately the Lord closes that door and says, no, you are not to even, you know, approach that person. Nope. So the Lord does when he doesn't want you to be in a relationship, he will close that door, you know, quite (laughs) strongly. (laughs) And you can still, you know, release uh, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, you know, to that person from a safe distance, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And the Lord knows what's best. We can trust him. (laughs) Yeah. I think for a long time, that was the hardest, you know, so many churches um, teach a false understanding of God's God's wrath and judgment, mm-hmm. um, you know, and they teach it without the full understanding of, of the extent of God's love. Yeah. And, you know, it took the Lord himself to really show me and, you know, about judgment and how he went through that was, you know, he started bringing me to all these scripture passages about where he gave out judgments. Mm -hmm. And he showed me that with each one, that there's always the judgment really is the warning. You know, if you do this, then this is going to be the consequence. Mm -hmm. But in that, you always have a choice. Yeah. Like you've got a warning and you understand what the consequence is if you follow through with that warning. Mm -hmm. But if you turn away and go the other direction, um, you know, so many times those judgments will come with, but if you return to me, if you come back to me, so the Mm -hmm. Lord uses those to call people back to himself And when they turn and come back to him, there's always that grace, that forgiveness, that mercy, that restoration. And Mm -hmm. that's really God's design in his heart, in his love. But at the same time, God is not unjust if, if that person chooses 
you know, no, I'm going to do this. And the Lord says, okay, you know what the consequence is. Even yes. to the point of there's going to be that day, you know, for those that choose things where the Lord will turn his face away. Um, you know, but that's, that's like the final straw. Mm -hmm. I think a good example of that is Pharaoh, you know, in Egypt out of Exodus, where it says the mm -hmm. Lord, you know, there came that moment where it says the Lord hardened his heart mm -hmm. um, because he, he kept refusing, you know, time and time again, after the Lord kept giving him that opportunity to, mm -hmm. to listen and return. Yes. You know? Yes. Just the incredible love and mercy of the Lord. And that oftentimes those judgments are merciful. You know, sometimes we don't think of it that yeah. way, but it is. It's, you know, this is what is best for you. This is, you know, where you can really be who you were meant to be. Um, you know, he's yeah. passionate to see us restored. And that's, that's the glory, <laughs> glory, glory. <laughs> and he rejoices in it. Mm -hmm. um, I read this great verse out of the Song of Songs uh, the other day, and it just, I mean, reading it just took my breath away because you think, you know, that psalm is, or that song is all about, you know, the marriage relationship, mm -hmm. but really it's about intimacy with God as well. And it was in, I want to say it was chapter three or four of that. And it starts to talk about, it says, you know, it kind of puts the characters into the lines. So you've got the groom king, you've got the, you know, the bride. And then at one point it said the Lord. And, and the part with the Lord, it, he said, I, what is this? I smell um, the f sweet fragrance of spices. And he says, I see the one coming up the mountain in glory, clothed or anointed in glory. Yes. But it was the Lord's response that he was like excited that he was like, you know, here's this one that's anointed to spend time with me. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of like, huh. But it immediately took me back to the passages of Moses and Jesus when they both ascended on the mountain um, and were covered with that glory of the Lord, that anointing, and w what sweetness that was to the Lord. And then it was like, you know, Lord, do you, <laughs> do you get that excited when I come into your presence? Like, uh, do you sit there all day and wait? You know, and then you start to think, well, how many times do I go about my day and God's the very last thing, you know, where he might be sitting there in the morning, just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then, you know, it's like we put him off all day. And, and so it's like, huh, like it really makes you think about your relationship with him. It does. And I, I love the other verse from Song of Solomon where it, it, talk, it says, you move me with one glance of your eye. <laughs> And I saw that. Yeah, I was on that one yesterday. <laughs> and to me, it's so encouraging because sometimes in our busy life, you know, we feel like, oh, you know, I don't have this extension, you know, this extended time and, you know, all of that. And it's like we move him just by a glance. And I, do. I have a great story for that, actually. Um, I was at the time I was uh, working with elderly people and was kind of managing households and things like that. And I had one client that, you know, I mean, it was pretty extensive work and I did like a lot of cleaning and, you know, grocery shopping, everything like that. But I had um, everything on a schedule, but that day, like, I think she had had something where I ended up having to do things that normally would have been later in the week, early, and I had to try to squeeze it all in in one day. So, I mean, I was just like busting my little butt off working. And I finally, like, I think it was quite a while because usually, you know, every five hours or so I would get a break, but I had gone like almost the full day with no break. I finally, you know, just went down to sit in the bathroom to have a few minutes to, to rest. And as I kind of like, you know, I just plopped down to sit. And uh, as I did that, um, I was like, ha, huh, boy, Lord, what are you thinking right now? 
And really it was meant to be a rhetorical question, <laughs> but the Lord answered me and he said, boy, the worship is great. And I, you know, forever, my mind just went straight to the angels and I was like, wow, I bet it is. I wish I could hear that right now. Right? <laughs> well, like eight years later, I'm ministering to some woman and I'm telling her the story about how, you know, how attentive God is to us and how even when we, you know, least expect it, he answers us. And I share the story with her and she goes, well, of course the worship was great. She's like, you were singing, weren't you? And it was like the first time I caught it, like I didn't even realize, because even at her house, I sang as I, as I cleaned and helped out with stuff. And I'm like, I guess I was. And she's like, well, of course, the Lord loves listening to you when you worship and sing. And I was like, huh, I not did not catch until all those years later that the Lord was speaking wow. about me. <laughs> I love when he gives those postscripts, you know. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and that's you know when I when I lead groups, we usually have encounter time at the end where we just engage with God, you know, in the heavenly realm. Sometimes in the courts, sometimes in different places. But you know, in the beginning, it was always like, oh, they're so excited to see us, and then it was like every single time, you know, there's this excitement, you know, and I'm like, well, it never never gets old, you know, and and for me to to think that. Um, before the foundation of the world, they saw this moment. Yeah. And they planned, you know, this special time that we would have an encounter, you know, with them. And it's, it's so just glorious to think, you know, again, it's just that one glance and it's like, oh my goodness, how excited they are. Um, you know, as we shift our attention to them, it's amazing. Yeah. And uh, just kind of continuing on with my adventures in Florida. Um, after seeing the Sound of Freedom movie, <laughs> we, <laughs> we went the next day to uh, Kennedy Space Center. It was like, God, you're just triggering me, you know, day after day here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and actually, I'll tell a little bit more on that. It was it was kind of interesting to me because um, it was the first time that it the pieces finally clicked. Like, you know, overall, I love Florida. Um, I love the beach, all of those kinds of things. But um, what I had noticed is that flying into Orlando or Miami, I have more difficulty. I can fly into Tampa and it's, it's a breeze. Mm -hmm. And um, so flying into to Orlando, it was like we crossed like from West Florida into East Florida and everything inside of me is going, get out of here. We don't want to be here. <laughs> get us out of here, you know. And then uh, that I do all these triggering things. It was like, oh, my poor, poor inner realm was struggling. But um, anyway, we went to Kennedy Space Center. It wasn't my first time. The first time I went on my own because I knew it might be very triggering. And so, you know, I went intentionally with the Lord to see what's here. Is this going to jog any memories? You know, that type of thing. And so, um it was just interesting after listening to you do the gateway experience on um, Aquarius arising mm -hmm. that um, I didn't notice it the last time, but this time, you know, the main building is called the gateway and the gateway experience. <laughs> and so I don't know if you want to just share a little, any little bits and pieces um, on yeah, that. Really, I break down through that. Like I share some of my personal stories and, kind of we read straight through um, the document for the gateway experience and then break down, you know, what do they mean by this? And, um, but it talks all the way through about, you know, how they start, they select children, what they're looking for, um, you know, what type of remote viewing uh, you do, how that can change your experience within the project system. So it really is in depth. I think there's, I think there's seven videos total oh. uh, between the two channels on the, that series. Um, but we really do an in-depth breakdown of it. And yeah. yeah. 
So I, I really encourage people to to listen to that um, and have heard some good feedback from other other survivors, how it's helping them to kind of put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it was funny at Kennedy Space Center, you know, this building and everything inside was hexagons. <laughs> and, um, you know, the simulator rides, you're leaving from port, you know, number 13, of course. You know? <laughs> and you're like, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> Um, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more the hexagon shape or even the octagon shape. Um, what significance that has in the cult or? Um, well, magic positioning, okay. uh, positions in magic circles. So, you know, you can have circles of five, six, eight, nine, um, you know, so it, it kind of, revolves strictly with, um, you know, I'll say the positioning also has to do with the authorities or the powers, the dominions that you're working with. So, you know, if you only have five or six, you know, that's going to be different than if you're working with all of the big eight or nine generals. Okay. Um, and, um, I think one of the other things that really bothered me, there was a Mars exhibit and, you know, so they're talking about Mars and, you know, all of that. And they, they end it with showing all of these children in space suits. And I, you know, and I know it's kind of the next generation type of thing, but um, also just kind of triggering and knowing that, you know, they do a lot of that also with children today. <laughs> And so I don't know if you have any experience or thoughts along that line um, that you had connection with or not. In specifically to Mars or? No, just to or the, using kids in different dimensions. I guess I'll say that way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I definitely have experience in that, <laughs> but um, not using children, but I was one of the children yeah. used in those dimensions and yes, I do still believe that is happening today and, you know, have been trying to show how that has been happening. And, you know, what's interesting or at the same time, it is really sad is that in scripture, um, you have kind of this underlying concept of um, nakedness being associated with being unashamed. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's in the Lord, it's, it's, unashamed mm -hmm. yet what the system does is they create that uh, concept of you know being naked is a shameful thing mm -hmm. therefore you have to be clothed and be clothed with all sorts of stuff um you know so there's a lot of misinformation in that that is caused through traumas mm -hmm. so that was particularly when you were talking i was sitting there thinking of those children it was like huh it was interesting that the bubble suits, like they sure give a lot of padding and it definitely keeps you as a child, not from having um, touch. So in that, like that's some of even their messed up, like, uh, you know, we talked about how they kind of like set things up where mm -hmm. things will seem good, seem safe. I know I had many experiences as a kid where they're like, you know, now we're going to go discover, you know, the Amazon or Antarctica and you get all excited. And I can remember we'd even have special speakers come in that would do those old, it wasn't the projector. What was, they would put all those little micro pictures oh, yeah. Yeah. in the thing. And then it would show the slide or whatever slides. Um, but we had somebody who came who was showing like all these creatures from Antarctica and, you know, they would ask, you know, pick what, what's your favorite animal? What did you like best? You know, would you eat lichen? Um, we even had, they brought in lichen to have us try it and stuff, <laughs> like all this stuff. So you get excited, right? You think you're safe. You think it's good. And, you know, then you find yourself, you know, so there's a part of you, you're willingly as a child, you're willing to participate. And then, you know, the trauma and the bad stuff starts to happen. Um, but you fall for it. He, 
<laughs> line, hook, and sinker every single time. You know, the next time they're like, oh, we're going here. And you're like, cool, Australia, koalas. You know, <laughs> then you find out, no, it's not good. <laughs> but I think the same thing, you know, I think that they would create safe environments, make the kids feel like it was something scientific, educational, uh, something structured. And then really you find out there's much more involved to that. Yeah. Yeah which I think the whole system, you know, is that way. And so, you know, afterwards, you know, my husband was like, well, you know, what do you think about, did they really land on the moon and, you know, things like this. And it's like, well, personally, I don't really know, but I think there's a whole lot more going on than they're showing here. And a lot of this, you know, with the Kennedy Space Center is just, you know, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts or insights on you know, did they land on the moon at that time or was that smoke and mirror? I, I believe it was faked. That's what I'm, I lean towards. Yeah. yeah I believe and it was faked. When you, when they were, you know, talking about how, you know, the technology back then was like back in the slide and rule days and, you know, our, our, our cell phones have more technology, you know, than, than those original, you know, space things. And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> Not really. That's what they want us to believe. Yet look at the wonders of the the earth. You know, I mean, look at the old ancient Aztec Incan pyramids. You know, I mean, these people moved massive stones um, using static and sound. Yeah, that we can't you even know. <laughs> and yet we can't people. use static and sound to, <laughs> to clean our own homes, right? But it was like... I mean, think of the things, even the, you know, the 14th through the 16th centuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the cathedrals, these beautiful buildings. I mean, they were making these phenomenal statues out of marble. Mm -hmm. And you look at the work and the detail, right? And then today, and this is not picking on artists. I, I'm just trying to show mm -hmm. the point. I mean, today things have become less intricate and detailed yeah. you know more of just like they slap a few stones together and call it art um you know and so it's like technology has not increased really what's happening is that the system is withholding mm -hmm. knowledge and wisdom and understanding from us um you know and they have had that knowledge wisdom and understanding the whole time yep. definitely definitely you have thoughts on AI? I know we're about ready to wrap up, but <laughs> I do. I mean, I really believe it's interconnected to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything that they're doing to set us up is no different than in the ancient days. Um, you know, where we, you know, people would interface with black mirrors, um, mm -hmm. you know, to connect to that spirit world. And I think that you know, they're just, they're trying to give us a narrative with it. They want us to believe that it's run by something, you know, technical or outside of the system when really I think it's demonic knowledge. Yeah. Well, even um, I just saw a trailer about a movie that's coming out. Maybe it's already out, but about, you know, a man who, you know, face loses his, you know, love of his life or whatever. And so he's depressed and, you know, this, AI comes along, you know, and he begins this romance with AI and how, you know, it turns out to be better than anything he's ever experienced. And it's like, that's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't want to think about what you're really having a relationship with. <laughs> so that's the scarier thing, yeah. you know, and what happens when that relationship goes bad? Um. <laughs> yes. So we're we're yeah. in for interesting times. I know that the Lord has solutions. You know, they talk about the AI singularity, and it keeps getting closer. I think the last estimate was twenty twenty nine, which we're you know fast approaching. And but uh, I know that God has a solution that's bigger than anything we can think or imagine. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, all of us have been working really hard to, to, you know, speak forth those solutions that the Lord has, um, you know, the topics, the things that the church is afraid to even address. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we put out here on Testimony Mountain. We share the testimonies of the things happening um, on kingdom living. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about how do we rise up? How has the Lord equipped us to deal with the issues and the trials that we face or, or the challenges that we're going through, both on Rise Up and Riding the Storms? Yes. And then, you know, on my show, The Reveal Report, um, you know, we really focus on those taboo topics that you know <laughs> the, the church doesn't want to talk about. So we do. I mean, we've talked about, you know, um, demons, you know, lustful demons and what happens when you find yourself in a situation where you're getting attacked by a demonic spirit. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how do you get them out of your home? And we've also talked about some of that stuff on Aquarius Rising. And, you know, I've got a lot of other shows that we're on, but all the, you know, shows that I'm on, we focus on those things, you know, mainly the topic of overcoming. How do we overcome through the spiritual challenges that manifest in the physical world? Yes. Nothing is impossible with God. And that's the good news. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll... true. We will wrap it up there today. Thank you again. So good to have you back on, Jesse, and look forward to much more. And so we just bless those of you who are watching. If this was encouraging to you, please share it, like, subscribe, pass it along. We want that good news to get out there. We don't want people to be in fear, wondering, you know, feeling overwhelmed by evil or the enemy. Um, We stand as overcomers together uh, with the Lord and proclaiming his good news. So we will see you next time on Testimony Mountain.